I would now like to teach you how to make kefir or kefir if you want to say it more accurately. There are two ways to make kefir. I'll just say kefir because it's uh, a little more natural for me not, not having grown up on kefir or kefir. So kefir is a fermented milk beverage. It's really similar to yogurt. You probably are familiar with it because it's entered the mainstream. You see it in the dairy section next to the yogurts. It's often sold flavored blueberry, strawberry, vanilla. Interesting though, interestingly though, it's really an ancient beverage and the stuff that we know in the store today is, I would say, sort of a cheap representation of the true stuff, the old world stuff. The old world kefir was made not commercially, but in small batches in people's home kitchens for thousands of years and the the inoculant, the little mix of cultures or bacteria and yeast that causes milk to turn into kefir, the, this collection of bacteria was something that was handed down through a family. It was a precious family treasure, I would say. So today I'm going to teach you how to make the real stuff, which um, there are many devotees of the real stuff. I'm also going to teach you how to make a simpler version of kefir, kefir, um, that will taste a little bit more mellow and a little bit more similar to the one that you find in the grocery store. So to start to make our kefir, the first thing we need is milk. Have some milk. The type of milk that you use is not so important. It's not as important as the milk that, that we use when we make Monterey Jack, Cheddar Jack. It's not as important as the milk that we use when we make chev. So it's a this is a little bit more flexible of a recipe, which is to say you can use goat's milk, sheep's milk, cow's milk, homogenized milk, unhomogenized milk. You have many options. You, in theory, could also reconstitute powdered milk to make yourself um, some kefir to start with, although I've never done that. I'm such a loyalist, uh, a loyal fan of very fresh, beautiful milk that I rarely go over to the dark side of powdered milk. Um, anyhow, you can choose whatever fat content, whatever species you want. And the, the one thing I would add in is the nicer the milk that you choose, the better the kefir is going to taste. That is something that I will preach till, till the end of my days, that the nicer the milk, the better the cheese, or the better the yogurt, or the better the kefir. So by nice milk, I mean milk that is very fresh, meaning it hasn't sat in your fridge for a long time. Milk that comes from smaller dairies is always gonna have more flavor and probably more nutrients, more, more um, quality minerals and vitamins than milk that's produced on larger scales. I, I love to shop locally, so I choose a local small-scale dairy here in San Francisco, and I just feel like the milk is as good as it gets. I mean, maybe having my own cow or having my own goat would mean even better, but for a city dweller who doesn't have a backyard, I, I can get some really wonderful milk from the store. So start with really nice milk. Today I'm using whole milk, it's cow's milk, and um, I have um, heated this milk up to room temperature, so about 72 degrees roughly. I heated it up um, to room temperature by just leaving it in a basin of warm water. Obviously, you could expedite that process by just pouring the milk into a pot, warming it up to room temperature. Um, another secret trick I do to get my milk warm, ready for inoculation, is when I'm washing dishes, I'll save that warm, sudsy water. I'll keep the container of milk sealed. And then when I'm done washing dishes, I'll just set the container, the gallon of milk in the warm water, wait 20, 30 minutes, and it's ready to go. So first recipe, I'm gonna teach you the old version, the old um, real kefir version. And that version of making kefir utilizes grains. They're called kefir grains. And they're these, they're, to somebody who's never seen them before, they're gonna appear strange. But to somebody who has drunk the kefir that's been made with the grains, they're gonna appear like little nuggets of gold. So let me just warn you, they're, they're a little bit obscure. What they are, are these jelly-like globs. Oh, did you hear that little, I just heard a little gas release when I opened this up. 
That's a sign of true kefir. So they're like, they're jelly-like blobs that are known as scobies, S-C-O-B-Y-S, symbi symbiotic colonies of bacteria and yeast. These little jelly globs are the family heirloom, the treasures that I was referring to that the grandmother would pass to the daughter who'd pass to the daughter so that a long line of um, generations would be able to benefit from this amazing inoculant. Okay, so inside this glass are those scobies, those kefir grains, and I want to get them, this is also finished kefir, and I know that because, can you um, see there's like some irregularity in the surface, do you want to, yeah? So this from a distance looks like milk, but you get closer up and you realize, no, this milk has changed. That's because the kefir grains, the scobies, have converted the milk into kefir. Um, there's a couple of things that are letting me know that stuff has gone on. One is I'm seeing this kind of breaking up, like little tiny pockets of whey. See that yellowish bit? And um, sort of some indentation. Another thing I'm seeing, which makes me excited because this is the way I like my kefir, is I'm seeing little tiny gas production, little gas bubbles as little tiny circles on the sides of the glass. I don't know if you can see it. If you look closely, you can see a bunch right there. Another thing that tells me that this kefir is good and ready is, well, first of all, the surface, I can see it's like looking almost like a little frothy. Again, to somebody who's not used to leaving milk out on their counter for a, um, a couple of days and then coming back, finding it fizzy and thinking that's delicious, this might be a little odd, but this is a very ancient tradition of fermenting milk and turning it into this not only delicious, but really healthful beverage. Okay, to extract the kefir grains from my finished jar of kefir, I'm going to um, pour them over a colander. And I usually can just kind of shake the, the kefir right out. Okay, so now I want you to see the grains that are left behind, the ones I've been talking about. Maybe I'll put them on a spoon so you can see them well. That's them. And these go from one glass of kefir to the next. They don't get eaten, although I guess you could eat them, but I don't really have any interest in doing that. They're these jellyish globs. I'm going to take them out of this glass because I'm already, this kefir is done. And I'm going to plop, this is maybe about a tablespoon worth. I'm going to plop them in my clean jar. And I'm going to cover that jar with my room temperature milk. I make small batches of kefir, the amount of kefir that I consume on my own. I try not to make too much because then I fall behind and I have too much kefir, kefir around the house. So I'm just going to make about a cup worth. As far as an exact recipe, how many grains to how much milk, um, it's very flexible. The more grains you have, the more quickly your milk is fermented and turn, turns into kefir. The fewer grains you have, the longer, the more amount of time, the longer the time that you leave the jar of fermenting milk at room temperature. So anyway, about a tablespoon of kefir grains in this example, covered up with a cup of room temperature, 72 degrees Fahrenheit milk. And I'm just gonna cover it up loosely and I'm gonna leave this at room temperature. I'm gonna start off by checking it at about six to ten hours. Much like sour cream or creme fraiche, crema, this is a very flexible recipe and it's really for you to decide at what point in the fermentation process you like the flavor, you like the texture, you like the fizz. So you can let it ferment for less time and have a milder beverage, let it ferment for more time and have a very sour, very fermented beverage. I think we should try the kefir that I made yesterday and just see if we like where it's going, if I like where it's going. So let's see. You can see it's more liquid than yogurt. Um, 
you can play around with your keeper and get it to be thicker if you want, but traditionally it is a drinkable fermented milk beverage. So let's see how this one tastes. Mmm. I love this. Um, it tastes not as sour as it could be, so it's got a sweetness to it, but it's just the slightest bit effervescent, so I can taste like a little Pringle of carbonation in here. That's because those globs, those scobies, have yeast in them, and as the yeast digests the sugar in the milk, they create carbonation, much the way that you get carbonation when yeast break down sugars in, to make beer. So, a little bit of carbonation, a little bit tangy, but not terribly tangy. A little bit sweet, so that's a, a unique characteristic to kefir. There's almost like a very subtle yeasty taste to it, really subtle, it's pleasant. So this, as I was saying, is the more traditional form of kefir, kefir. If I wanted to, I could easily sweeten it up, give it some fruit flavor, fruit characteristics. Like I could just stir in a little bit of raspberry jam and make it my morning smoothie. Could do it like this. And now I have something that's a bit closer to the stuff you know in the store. Mm -hmm. It's good. I've taught you how to make kefir using grains or scobies, those jelly-like things. I'd now like to teach you how to make kefir the more commercial way, using cultures which are in powdered form that come from the laboratory. So just a note about the various forms of kefir and kefir. The scobies, those little jelly-like things, those are considered this evolving symbiosis, little collection of organisms that are evolving through time. What that means is that if you have a warm summer day and you're making kefir, those grains and all the, the components, the organisms that, com that constitute the grain, they're evolving. Maybe one population is growing stronger while another is growing weaker but then maybe you go to the other side of the year and stuff switches. What I'm trying to say is it's variable, it's changing. And the truth is that those are not characteristics that we often associate with commercial food production because we need commercial food production to be really standardized and stable, predictable. So the commercial kefir that you know is made with this cocktail of both yeast and bacteria. I'll show you what it looks like. Just about like powdered milk. Every single time I make kefir using this, it's going to turn out identical to the previous batch because this is stored in the freezer and it's already a defined ratio of one organism to another. It's not gonna be evolving through time like the grains are. So this is a more predictable kefir, it tends to be a little bit mellower and um, definitely it's, um, I'd say it's a good beginning kefir to make because you know it's gonna, what it's going to taste like. You don't have to worry about it changing through time. How do I make it? Same as the other kefir recipe, I start with room temperature milk. The milk can be goat, sheep, cow, uh, buffalo. I have no experience using non-animal milk, so I know the chemistry of animal milks. I can't say that this will work with soy or almond or rice milk. So stay with me on the dairy side. And I'm going to, um, I'll do a one cup version. Fill up my clean glass with a cup of room temperature milk. This is definitely a personalized kefir batch, meaning I'm not making, I could make larger amounts, but um, I like to make small enough amounts that I know I'm gonna keep on top of it, eat what I'm producing. If you were to be com producing commercially, you could just scale up in, um, you could scale up proportionally, meaning you could do this exact same recipe on a five gallon vat or 10 gallon vat, but make sure you have customers that can consume 10 gallons worth of kefir because once it's done, it's ready to eat. It's not really a product that you would make to store or age. To my one cup of um, room temperature milk, I'm gonna add a pinch, which is I think technically a 16th of a teaspoon. So I'm just gonna do a pinch. There's my pinch on the handle of a clean spoon. 
and I'm gonna tap it gently across the surface of the milk. I'm gonna put this back in the freezer as soon as possible so that it stays active and doesn't evolve. And then the grains that, or the cultures that fell on the surface of this milk, they're dissolving. I'll give them a minute more to dissolve and then I'm gonna stir them in gently. Let me just put this in the freezer. Okay, so stir in my cultures and that's both bacteria and yeast that I'm stirring into the milk. Cover it up and leave it at room temperature. We're gonna check in at 10 hours, but we're gonna plan to leave it for between 24 and 36 hours, roughly the same amount of time as I'm leaving my kefir grains. So let's check back in in a bit. People often ask me, what do you do with the kefir grains if you're not actively making kefir? The answer is give them a little bit of food and store them in the fridge. So here are the kefir grains in milk. There they are. If I give them a fresh batch of milk, let's just say I'm going to be heading out of town, I can take those grains, pour about a cup worth of fresh milk over the top, cover them, and put them in the fridge. They'll store beautifully for about two weeks. After that time, they'll start to diminish a little bit in their activity, but you can wake them back up by giving them a bunch of quick generations. By that, I mean take the grains out of the milk, give them fresh milk, let them run short cycles, like four hours, then move them to a new glass of milk. In this way, you get them extra active again. When the pot reaches between 190 and 195, I'm gonna add a modest amount of acid. I can add the acid in the form of white vinegar, or I can add the acid in the form of citric acid. Today I have some citric acid. It's in crystal form. So I'm gonna dissolve it in some water before adding it. 